So speaking of God, you mentioned to me offline you're wearing uh, the the most sophisticated clothing choice um, of the elite intellectuals. Uh, like you mentioned, Sam Harris was wearing a hoodie. This is the Sam Harris hoodie. He's starting a trend. He's starting a trend. <laughs> Um, this is a new religion, you could even say. It's a ritual. It's a ritual practice <laughs> of uh, intellectuals, of searching for meaning. Uh, so there's there's a, quite a fascinating debate. So he, he was, for a time, still um, known as one of the sort of new age atheists. Hmm. So he was kind of trying to explore the role of religion in society and uh, the role of science. And then on the other side, another kind of powerhouse intellectual is Jordan Peterson, who in um, sometimes, for my taste, a bit too poetic of ways, is exploring the ideas of religion. Uh, and they had these interesting debates that I think will continue about the role of religion in society. For, uh, uh, for Jordan, there's all these flaws with religion, but there is a lot of value to be discovered amidst the the rituals, the traditions, the practice, the way we conceive of each other because of the ideas that religion propagates. And then for Sam, it says that everything about religion is uh, basically gets in the way of us fully realizing our human potential, which is deeply scientific and rational and uh, sort of like the, we're surrounded by mystery calling that mystery God is getting in the way of us understanding that mystery. And what do you think about this debate about the role of religion and society? We should continue having this debate. I talked to Jordan a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact. Excellent. <clears throat> and, and On his he, podcast? Yes. Public? Excellent. It'll, it'll be out soon. And so, uh, you know, he and I... How did that go, by the way? Um, it, was, it was incredible. Uh, Carl Ruck, the professor, joined us, as a matter of fact, for one of his rare public appearances. So Beautiful. We went, we went deep. Um, and Jordan is very well-read, obviously, on the psychedelic literature. He had just had um, Roland Griffiths from Hopkins on the podcast. And it's one of Roland's figures that Jordan and I, again, just like the, the language of Aldous Huxley, it's hard to move past the following statistic. Um, over the past 20 years, of the modern study of psilocybin, Roland will tell you that about three in four of their volunteers walk away from their single dose of psilocybin, high dose, saying it was among the most meaningful experiences of their entire lives, if not the most meaningful. And Jordan says, like, how do you, what do you do with that? Um, uh, how do we, I mean, how do we synthesize that? Um, you know, here we are, quantifying the the qualifiable the unqualifiable and and yet these these compounds have dramatic effects on people's lives and they walk away feeling like they're more loving more compassionate um, the science of all talks about um, the the welling up of cooperation and resource sharing and kindness and all these strange things from this single chemical intervention which seems to reduce us to automata as if enlightenment can be flipped on uh, like a switch. And yet there it is, there's the data. And I don't see how you walk away from that. I mean, I, I completely understand Sam's position, um, but I think there's there's a reading of religion, particularly the mystical core of, of the big faiths and especially these ancient mystery cults, which do speak again to those moods and motivations, um, creating this aura of factuality that these volunteers never walk away from permanently transformed, just like the ancient mysteries. And part of that is perhaps language, that we need to continue to evolve language in um, in how we conceive of the, these processes. Maybe religion has a bunch of baggage associated with it that um, it's good to let go of, or perhaps not. I don't know, it did, like, this is connected to our previous part of our conversation is the importance of language in this whole thing. Well, that's how I start my book with one of these volunteers from the NYU psilocybin experiments, mm -hmm. this, this woman, Dinah, Dinah Baser, who's an atheist. Mm -hmm. And she still describes herself as an atheist. And yet, as one of these three and four people who walked away from this experiment transformed, she says that her experience of psilocybin was like being bathed in God's love from an atheist. <laughs> yes. And I ask her why she uses the word God. Why not the love of the cosmos? or the universe or mother nature. 
And she says, well, frankly, you know, we don't know about any of this stuff mm -hmm. and that God makes sense to me. Um, she's still an atheist, um, but it's the way she describes that as kind of like the way your mother's love must have felt when you were a baby. Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of, I like the way Einstein uses God. God doesn't play dice. There's a poetry. There's a humility that you don't know what the hell is going on. There's a humor to it. I'm a huge fan, especially like more and more of just kind of, having a big old laugh at the absurdity of this world and this life as uh, represented nicely by memes on Twitter kind of thing. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a sense in which we want to be playing with these words and not take them so seriously and being a little bit lighthearted and explore.